Well, we uh, started looking a, a couple days ago at the what I call the, the vortex of darkness that the non-Christian finds him or herself descending into, a place where they... Uh, their thinking is is all wrong, and the direction they're taking is uh, really nothing but a pursuit of reality within an ever darkening world. And ultimately, they they just go through a hardening of their heart towards God because they simply have no idea. They have no accurate information about who they are, who God is, and how their life is supposed to be lived. That's really the value of the Bible. What the Bible does is it fills our brain with accurate information. What, what the Bible lays out is God's plan for the redemption of mankind, a redemption that became necessary because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden that separated mankind from God and has been, and that genetic disability has been passed on to you and me up until the present time. Christ came into the world, offered himself a sacrifice, not to be a great teacher, not to be a miracle worker. Those things were all about confirming the reality that he was God who had become a man, but so that we would humble ourselves, confess our sins, receive him as our savior, as the only one who can save us, despairing of our own ability to fix ourselves and redeem ourselves, and falling before the cross of Christ and say, God, forgive me my sins, and the promise of 1 John 1, 9 is if we confess our sins, that he's just and faithful to forgive us. Well, the way I put it, he forgives, and then he starts to fix us. And so uh, ultimately, heaven is the place where we're permanently fixed. But as a Christian, we need to always keep in mind that every day is about fixing the disorders in our life, that we all have been impacted by certain traumas and certain things that have done. We're all victims of, of sin one way or another. Uh, not all sins and victimizations were intentional, but some were. Many of us have been victimized by people who uh, were so self-absorbed they didn't even have a thought about the damage that they might be doing to us. All they can think about is winning and getting what they want. So, I mean, we all begin victimized. The danger is that if we don't come to Christ, we will become a victimizer because we'll do to others what was done to us. How do you change that? By letting Christ do for you what you couldn't do for yourself and you find yourself wanting to do for others what Christ has done for you. And even though I can't actually do that, but I can introduce them to Jesus and tell them that Jesus is the pro it's not only forgave me, but he's in the process of fixing me every day. I am not fixed, I'm not perfect, don't wanna go there, but the truth of the matter is, God by his Holy Spirit is constantly working a, a work of fixing in me day by day, moment by moment, situation by situation, so that we start learning to look for God in those moments. Well, this is the contrast again that Paul brings as, as we bring to the, the end of this section where he says, they've also lost all sensitivity. Uh, and what that probably more literally could be translated is they lose the capacity to feel any shame or embarrassment. You know, it's interesting. People say, well, we have an epidemic of shame in America. People feel shameful and guilty. And we can feel shame about things that we shouldn't be ashamed. I mean, uh, I was so, it was pounded in my mind so repeatedly as a child that I, I couldn't go to bed without brushing my teeth that if I don't brush my teeth and try to fall asleep, my conscience begins to eat at me and I have to get up and brush it no matter how late uh, it is at night. Uh, and my wife thinks that's kind of whacked out and is kind of, it is kind of, kind of dysfunctional, quite honestly. But the truth of the matter is, he's talking about people who do things that are shameful, things that they should hope that nobody ever finds out about, and yet they no longer feel it. In fact, he goes on to say in another place that they actually boast in the things that they do. They take pride in being homosexual, being an adulterer, being a fornicator, being a drug abuser, being a, a liar, a thief, a criminal, whatever. They actually take pride. Their identity is in how evil they can be because in the loss of sensitivity, they no longer recognize that some things are good and some things are evil. This is where I think evolutionary uh, theology has affected so many people because we've convinced kids from earliest ages that their life has no meaning and no purpose. We are just simply some kind of cosmic chemical accident and therefore how we live our life really doesn't matter. And that even the good things we do is a part of selfish self-preservation. So there is no real pure good that's ever done. Well, 
when you raise a generation and generations upon generation with that kind of thinking, is it surprising that they become really predators and, and cannibalistic and become so self-absorbed that the only thing, the only person they can think about is themselves, their power, their prosperity, and their pleasure? So he says they've, they've lost that ability to be ashamed. So when you do something and you know it's wrong and you feel bad about it, that is not a bad sign. That is a good sign. Now you need to make a discernment. Am I feeling guilty about something that God never condemned? I mean, really, I've never read anything in the Bible about brushing my teeth, and so I shouldn't feel guilty. That's, that's a false shame, a false guilt that I may carry. But there is also a true guilt that when I lie, I cheat, I steal, I do things that are wrong, I should feel bad about that if I have a sensitivity to the hand of God, like we talked about yesterday, that God can put his hand on my shoulder that moment and say, you're not really being quite honest here or truthful or humble or loving, whatever the issue is, because I'm like you, I got them all. <laughs> I haven't skipped any, but he, he goes on to say that not only that, number six, he says, they've given themselves over to sensuality. In other words, the word sensuality is used there, leads a, a complete lack of any kind of moral restraint as so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And it, especially the word that's used there emphasizes sexual impurity. In other words, they began to dive deeper and deeper into sexual immorality as a way of making them feel good about themselves. You know, it's interesting. Sexual intimacy was given to us by God so that when we go into a committed relationship with uh, one man and one woman, a, a heterosexual relationship, when we, we are committed to that, that physical intimacy, he said, brings to a oneness, a, a joining together of our hearts and our bodies in a way that um, uh, really becomes fulfilling and sa satisfying. And yet, when people violate the context in which sexual intimacy is supposed to take place, it's, it's supposed to be in a committed, lifelong, heterosexual relationship between one man and one woman, you take it out of that into another context. And it doesn't matter what the context is. I mean, with all these letters that we have describing various behaviors, the reality is, all of that is only secondary in consideration. The how you're, you're trying to fulfill yourself is one issue, but the reality is you're trying to fulfill your, your soul by feeding your belly. In other words, we become an appetite-driven culture. And the more people become appetite-driven, the worse it becomes because we become predatorial. We see other people as objects that we can manipulate and use or consume quite literally, as C.S. Lewis put it. And uh, he said that's the problem of Eros love. It seeks to be consumed without being consumed. It wants to consume the other person to satisfy their needs, but never wants to ever have to share who they really are with another person. And so he says, this becomes natural. When they become no longer sensitive, feel no shame, there's no limit to where they will go in their efforts to fulfill their sensual desires. So if you wanna understand sociologically what's going on in the world today, and particularly in America, this is what's happening. People are so unfulfilled, so em empty, that they're just pursuing every kind of sensuality, whether it be drug, sex, or rock and roll. They're trying everything they can to satisfy this appetite. And, uh, <clears throat> but the problem is, that is its own bottomless pit. That is its own living hell because the seventh and last thing he said about the, the life of the non-Christian is he lives with a continual lust for more. In other words, it's like the drug addict. He never stops. He always has to have a bigger and bigger dosage of whatever he or she is connected to. And so we see people who are sexual addicts. They're, they're pornographic addicts. They're drug addicts. Um, they're rageaholics, they're angry and bitter people, they're, they're basically sociopathic, and in some cases I think it's almost psychopathic because they never come to the end. When we look at many of the totalitarian despots in the world or those even in the current regime who would like to be totalitarian despots, what it is is they'll never have enough power, they'll never have enough control. They'll never have enough dominance. They will be driven and driven and driven until they literally, like Elmo and Thelma and Louise, they drive off the cliff. And that's really why you find that this ultimately ends the destruction of cultures and societies and even entire nations, and ultimately will end in the judgment of this world when Christ comes back, because at that point, we'll find that the Antichrist, the ultimate totalitarian dictator, despot, tyrant, will be reigning over the earth 
and it will be a living hell on the planet. You can see that when you read through the book of Revelation. So again, Paul said, that's how non-Christians live. When we see kind of manifestations of some of these behaviors in us, that's when we really need to come before the Lord and say, God, forgive me, cleanse me and remove from me, Lord. That's why I say that when I talk to people who are Christians and they're living in an immoral relationship, uh, that if they're truly saved, they're going to repent. And if they don't have an interest in repenting, then I question whether or not they're truly saved. But as Paul would say to the Corinthians, I believe better things of you. And that's why the fact that you're listening to this and putting up with my ramblings tells me you're a man or woman who has a heart for God. You're not perfect. God is in the process of fixing you, even though you still have some plumbing that probably needs to be rewired. Nonetheless, God loves you and he's working in you and you need to kind of, we need to maintain a positive view of what's going on and where we're going into the future. Well, it's been a good week for me. I hope this has been helpful and uh, I'll look forward to carrying on the conversation next week. Go in his grace and I pray that you'll experience God's many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.